The next player in our immune system story is the B cell. The B cell is actually the primary player in humoral immunity. So let's take a close look at the B cell and see exactly what it is. So B lymphocytes, also called B cells, uh, they develop in the bone marrow. So think B for bone marrow. And there's some cool things about them. First off, every B cell makes its own unique receptor. So your, uh, like, your, your, in your bone marrow, you make billions of B cells. And every B cell has a unique, what's called, B cell receptor. These B cell receptors are Y-shaped and, in fact, are almost exactly identical to antibodies because they're basically antibodies, or at least they're the things that become antibodies. The only real difference between a B cell receptor and an antibody is that a B cell receptor is a receptor found in the membrane. So it remains bound to the membrane, whereas a real antibody is going to actually be released into the blood or into the fluid and become disconnected from the cell. But it's basically the same thing as an antibody. It's just a membrane-bound receptor antibody, and sometimes they're even called antibody receptors. So you could have billions of B cells, and each one of them has its own special snowflake receptor, right? And each one of them is going to bind to something different, right? So you got, like, billions of B cells, and, like, you could have some random chemical out there, and it might not bind to 999,999,999 of them, but one of them, one of them will bind to it. Usually it's going to be more than one. They're just going to be binding to different parts of it, but still, right? So this is what's totally awesome about B cells. And I'll, I'll explain later exactly how the B cells get so many different receptors because like if they're making billions of different receptors, then um, like you don't have billions of different genes. You don't even have millions of different genes. So they have to do some real work to get that many different proteins. But when I say that they're all different, I'm being a little bit cagey here because most of it is actually the same, right? So you've got all of this Y-shaped portion here. That's called the FC, or constant fragment, and that's the same on every one. But the ends that you see here these are called the FV, or variable fragments, and that's the part that's going to be different. And that's the part that's going to do the binding. That's where the binding is located. So the binding part of each of these antibodies is going to be different. So it's the first thing to know about B cells, they all have a unique receptor that's basically an antibody, and each of those receptors binds something different, All right? Second thing is that when B cells are made, they're originally born in the bone marrow, but they also get trained in the bone marrow. And they're trained by basically exposing them to all of the proteins that your body makes. You want to make sure that none of these B cells can make antibodies that stick to you. Because if a B cell makes antibodies that sticks to you, that could cause an autoimmune disease. And we don't want that. So these B cells, while they are undergoing their training, are exposed to all of the different proteins that your body makes. And any of them that binds to any of those proteins, killed. All right? 
So that's the first selection that goes through, right? So we, we would call those uh, immature B cells, and then they get uh, uh, negatively selected. So any of them that bind to any of your proteins get whacked, right? The ones that come out on the other side are mature but naive, which means that they're inactive. And those are the B cells that are floating around in your blood. Naive B cells, um, they float around in your butt, blood waiting to bind for something, right? And when they get this signal that they are required, when one of them realizes that it is the one cell in your body that can make this antibody that's going to fight off this infection and keep you alive, right? Then it will turn into, it will develop into what's called a plasma cell. A plasma cell is an advanced form of the B cell that now will make the, and export the antibodies into the local environment. This process by which a B cell becomes activated and becomes a plasma cell is the rest of this video. It's actually not even the rest of this video. There's more videos to come that we'll keep talking about it because this is a very, very regulated process. Why is it a very regulated process? Why can't this just be easy? My God, why can't it just be easy? Well, it turns out it's because antibodies are super dangerous. Antibodies are super powerful. Antibodies are like your body's equivalent of nuclear weapons, right? Anything that gets targeted with an antibody, your body is going to do everything that it can to destroy it. We'll have a, a video up on antibodies and all of the different types of antibodies, and all the different ways in which they work. But there's like six different ways that antibodies can kill things and all of them are nasty. So if you make antibodies against something, you want to make as sure as possible that it is not something you want to keep around, that it's not something that's part of you at least a part of you that you care about. And even with all of the checks and balances against it, sometimes you end up making antibodies against yourself. But, um, you know, autoimmune diseases are fairly rare. Uh, but if you didn't have such rigid control over B cells, they would be much, much more common. So all of these controls that I'm going to talk about and they are to prevent a B cell from basically going wild and not launching nukes against your own body, which would be bad. In addition to turning into memory cells, or uh, sorry, blah, in addition to turning into plasma cells, B cells can also turn into memory cells. And memory cells are long-lived cells that keep the immunogenic memory of things that your B cells have been exposed to. So whenever a B cell becomes activated to produce antibodies, it will also produce some memory cells so that next time you encounter that thing, it will be much easier and faster to activate. So let's take a look at what's going on. You got millions of B cells floating around in your blood at any one time, each with its own B cell receptor. That B cell receptor is basically an antibody bound into the membrane. So here I've just got three of them. Um, and uh, here you've got one, two, three, but really there's going to be millions of them. They're going to be all over the place. There are two methods for activating B cells. That's important enough, I'm gonna underline it in yellow. Two methods to activate them. The first is called T-independent activation. This is the easy way to activate them. Right? This is very fast. It produces a fast response, but it's dangerous. 
it bypasses a lot of the safety checks that are there to keep your B cells from killing you. So only very specific antigens can activate this method. Those are called T-independent antigens because they activate the T-independent method. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about what those are in, in a second, but keep in mind, I'm explaining this now because it is the easiest to understand, not because it is the most common. T-independent activation is actually rather rare and only applies to a few specific, very dangerous pathogens. You'll understand why I call this the one key method once I've talked about the two key method. So let's say you're going around doing your thing and you get uh, invaded by a bacteria. So here we get a bacteria. And this bacteria, and this is a requirement of the T-independent activation, has a special antigen. Uh, what this antigen needs to have is repeated antigens, right? So you have the same thing repeated over and over and over and over. It's usually a non-protein, uh, often a polysaccharide. So here we got this bacteria with this, like, repeating antigen hanging off of it. Maybe it's an LPS, maybe it's a flagella, something like that, all right? So we see here, boom, these two things, they don't match up. This, this uh, B cell receptor cannot bind that antigen. Next, boom. Now we look, look here, see? This B cell receptor binds that antigen perfectly. It's not going to ever hit on the second go, right? This bacteria could like run into millions of B cells before it finds the one B cell in your body or one of the very few B cells in your body that can actually bind to it. But in order to get T-independent activation, you have to have stimulation of multiple receptors and they have to be close to each other. So you have to get like a whole bunch of receptors in a row to be stimulated. And that means that you have to have one of these repeating antigen type things, okay? So what's gonna happen now? Well, this B cell receives an extremely strong signal from all of these receptors that are uh, being bound together. And so now it becomes active. And when it activates, what it's gonna do is uh, take in all of its B cell receptors. And then it's going to morph or uh, differentiate into a plasma cell. And uh, by the way, when it does this, it's actually gonna divide into a whole bunch of plasma cells. So the plasma cell is going to divide a whole bunch. So you get a whole bunch of plasma cells, and plasma cells make antibodies. So it's going to start making antibodies. Those antibodies are going to go out. They're going to stick to the bacteria that, um, that triggered this, and they're going to do their antibody thing, leading to the destruction of those uh, bacteria. That's pretty easy, right? Thing binds to cell cell develops into killing machine and then produces killing proteins. Super easy thus far. So the T-independent antigens, um, like I said, they, uh, uh, there are relatively few of them. Uh, they have to have identical evenly spaced epitopes. Uh, the epitope is the thing that actually binds to the antibody. Um, and uh, specifically, I want you guys to know that capsules and LPS are both T-independent antigens. 
The advantage of T-independent activation is that it is very, very fast. It's much faster than, um, than the normal method, which is obviously going to be the T-dependent method. Uh, and it makes sense when you think about it, like bacteria with capsules tend to be very pathogenic, right? They're good at hiding from the immune system. So if you can detect those capsules very early and hit them hard, then uh, these bacteria are, then you can maybe get rid of this infection before it kills you. Same with LPS. You find LPS on, on gram negatives and gram negatives are all endotoxic. In fact, that's the LPS that's endotoxic. So if you, if you get a, an infection with gram negative bacteria, you want to get rid of that thing as fast as possible. These are both very dangerous uh, antigens or, or antigens that are found on very dangerous organisms. So there, it, it, it makes sense that you're going to take a little bit of a risk in order to get rid of them quickly. But it's not something that you want to do all the time. Now, as for the flaws of it, I'm going to save those until later when I can compare it to the other method. Uh, but one thing that I'll mention here is that it doesn't really work well in young children, right? So young children don't really have this much. T-dependent activation. What I call the two key method. This is the normal way. This is the main way that, uh, that B cells become activated to start producing antibodies. Now, the reason why I call this the two key method, um, I'm a child of the 80s and there's like a, a famous genre of movie from the 80s. It was like the end of the Cold War. Everyone thought that nuclear war was going to break out. Lots of movies where, like, the Russians are coming or something like that. You know, things like Hunt for Red October or Dr. Strangelove or things like that. Actually, Dr. Strangelove doesn't have this. Um, there's a famous scene that you'll see in these type of movies where they're going to launch the nuclear weapons, right? You're going to launch the nukes. And um, one person can't launch the nukes. Makes sense. Why would you ever give nukes to a single person? Right? If, if you're on a ship that can fire nukes, then it takes two people. And the way they do this is that each person has a key. This guy's got a key. This guy's got a key. And, um, and their keys are spaced far enough apart that you can't actually like grab both of them. And uh, so if they get orders to fire their nukes, they have to agree. Like they have to talk to each other. They have to say, yes, I agree. We have received orders to fire our nukes. Let us now go into the world. And they each go and they have to turn their keys at the same time. And that's the only way the nukes can fire, right? And this was to prevent like some guy who's like, crazy or maybe his girlfriend dumped him and he's super depressed or whatever and just decides I'm gonna end it all and I'm gonna take the world with me and I'm gonna fire off all of our nukes. No one crazy person can fire the nukes. Um, it would take two crazy people and, and the idea that like both the people who have the keys would both go crazy in the same way at the same time is pretty unlikely. Like one crazy person I'll give you but two crazy people at the same time in the same place that's pretty unlikely. And remember I said that antibodies are like your, your immune system's equivalent to nuclear weapons. Extremely powerful, extremely dangerous. And you don't fire them off unless you know you need to and unless it's safe. Now a difference is that like nukes destroy everything. Whereas antibodies are extremely targeted if used correctly. And the reason why you need these two keys is to make sure that they are used correctly and that they are never deployed against your own cells. It's not perfect, but it's as good as we can get. 
So, T-dependent activation. Uh, this time I've drawn a virus. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a virus or a bacteria for this. Like T-dependent activation works against all sorts of foreign uh, antigens. So, but here we have a virus. The virus has infected this person. It's floating around. This person's got millions of B cells again, and every B cell has its own unique B cell receptor. So, you boom, that doesn't fit there. Eh, all right, maybe it bumps into the next one. Yeah, that one doesn't fit either. Whatever. Goes to the next one. Oh, yeah, that one fits. The virus kind of bumps around against a whole bunch of B cells until one of them eventually goes, oh, hey, it just so happens that my antibody thingy binds this guy. All right, so what happens next? Well, I'll tell you what doesn't happen. It doesn't just become a, 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 a plasma cell and start making antibodies, right? Like, this isn't a special thing. This isn't like linking together a whole bunch of receptors at the same time. This is binding one of them. So the B cell is going to internalize this. It's going to take it in by endocytosis. Sometimes it'll take in the whole virus or the whole bacteria. Sometimes it'll just take in the little bit that it's stuck to. What it needs is the bit that it's stuck to, what's called the antigen, the thing that generated the antibody response. So the B cell is going to take that in. It's going to destroy all of the stuff that wasn't, you know, what it was bound to. There we see it's like destroying the, the rest of the virus. But it's going to take that bit that it was bound to and stick it on a protein. Yeah, we've seen this protein before. This is an MHC2. So B cells are APCs. There are missing APC. This B cell bound something. He said, oh my God, my receptors can bind to this thing. And I took it in and like, tore apart the virus, and now it is displaying whatever it was that its, its receptors bound. It's displaying that on an MHC2. So it's an antigen-presenting cell as well. It's a little bit got a different function, as we'll see. The mononuclear phagocytes are going to do something different with their presentation than the B cell is though they're related. Um, but this is, like the B cell is an antigen-presenting cell. There it is, presenting an antigen right there. Now as for what happens next, we're going to have to go back and start looking at some of our other players again. We're going to have to go back and look at our antigen-presenting cell, our other antigen-presenting cell, the dendritic cell that we started off with, and see what it's been doing in the meantime.